Welcome, one and all, to the mystical world of Felbar. Adventures abound throughout this realm, and we appreciate the opportunity to regale you with some stories from these trails. These accounts are all based on actual RPG experiences that occurred within Adventures in Felbar. Some of these tales may be for mature audiences, while others may be for very immature audiences. We now present the sage Mikas Tumo from Tamel, also known as the Bard of Felbar. Welcome to Session Denali-06. A cock crowed and the sunlight filtered into the room of the Sunset Inn. Sir Omel, Brother Stance, and Harris the Mage each had drawn straws the night before, with the monk drawing the short one, making him the babysitter for Kellogg's the halfling and Phidias the party rogue. With dull senses, he got out of bed but stumbled on one of the demi-humans that had shifted during the night. Instinct took over and he was able to do a flip in mid-air, coming in with a prepared strike. A loud, hey that was my foot, was exclaimed by the gnome, and Brother Stance recalled the previous evening and relaxed. Looking out of the window, he roused the pair and told them to get up for breakfast. A few minutes later, the trio arrived in the common room with Kellogg's wearing one of the bed sheets as a wrap, as he had not had clothes when he was first encountered. The rest of the group were already eating a meal at the large table in the room and laughed loudly at the sight of the diminutive man in bedding. Grish laughed so hard that he spit food out of his nose and gave a smart salute, saying, Hail, imperious leader, before choking on a piece of bread. Serves you right, said Kellox, as he rubbed his hands together and squeezed in between Harris the mage and Yolanda two blades. The squat man moved quickly as he grabbed food from the middle of the room and stuffed his face with it. Sir Omel, knight of Bacchus, was partially offended and gave a smug, Please do help yourself. Do not be concerned with me, metal warrior. I'm not shy. The group filled their bellies and paid their tab, but sat around the table comparing notes of what each had learned the day before. After several minutes, Brother Stance spoke up, stating, So we aren't needed and can move on? The group nodded in agreement, but Grish raised his hand. There is definitely something wrong here, and paying off a dragon seems like a, well, a stupid idea to me. Yolanda, with a distressed look, spoke up, stating that while she hated to agree with the cleric, she believed he was right. Something just didn't fit in this situation. Kellogg's, who was picking his teeth with some flatware that had belonged to Harris, asked what the big deal was. As the group shook their heads, he continued, I've had to deal with that flying lizard for the past several weeks, and I'm telling you everything is fine. The group sat in stunned silence until Harris pulled the fork away from Kellogg's. The halfling, when prodded for an explanation, stated that he had been assigned as a cartwright to deliver the silver to the old Tobeth shrine in the north. Master Scaly swoops in, takes possession of the silver, we unload it, and leave. The creature doesn't come back to Red Bluffs, and everyone's happy. What are your problems, the man said. The group looked at each other, bewildered by the account given by this young stranger, until finally Phidias spoke up and pointed out, Dragons tend to be greedy bastards. If you continue to give it silver, eventually they will want more. Grish was taken aback at the lucid description and softly clapped his hands together. He then looked at Kellogg's and explained that the missive from the King Pellet did grant the Bayo a wide swath to deal with the issue, but added that he was fairly confident that giving away silver was not what was expected. The wizard piped up next, pointing out that the region certainly couldn't support pain off the beast for a very long time anyway. The group nodded and then began to pepper the indigenous halfling with a variety of questions until he covered his ears, silencing them all. You people are driving me nuts. He looked at each one individually and answered their questions. No, it doesn't talk to me. Yes, there is a whole cartload every week. No, you can't sleep with my mother. Yes, it is alone. It's about half a day away. And no, I don't know how it carries off the silver. Jeez, cut me some cloth here, folks. I'm just the delivery boy. 
After a brief discussion, it was decided that the group would go with Kellogg's in the morning during his standard trip to the shrine to deliver silver. The halfling confirmed that he usually takes a few people to help unload the supply, and the party could certainly use the exercise, which caused Grish to bristle. Look, the halfling continued, you meet me outside the fortress, and I'll take you to Toba's shrine, and you can see if the dragon will deal with you. There's no need for horses, we can only go as fast as the wagon anyway. Besides, we don't have any horses in town. After the late breakfast, Kellogg's left to return to his own home, and the party spent the rest of the day attempting to stay out of trouble. Yolanda, Harris, and Phidias opted to leave the inn for a short time to check on any potion shops in the event that portable healing was needed. After obtaining directions to a few locations, the trio found themselves at Haybar's Alchemal Wonders. A small copper bell signaled the entrance in the shop, and an older man with graying temples stood behind the counter. A line of gibberish was spoken, with both Harris and Phidias looking at Yolanda for help. As the fighter began to speak with the proprietor, the two adventurers began to look around. In a hushed tone, the mage warned Phidias not to touch anything. I don't know why you're whispering, that geezer can't hear, and he probably can't speak our language anyway. A great deal of baubles and interesting items were found in the shop, which the pair examined intently. Guys, we've got a deal, said Yolanda. Harris walked up to the fighter, and she explained that Haybar, the owner, had six elixirs of healing that would cost 15 silver pieces each. Do you guys have enough to cover everyone, she asked. Harris hoisted his bag to jingle the many coins and confirmed that they would be fine. Yolanda nodded to the owner in agreement, who said something to make the fighter upset. A small argument ensued, but ended when Haybar nodded behind the pair. In the middle of the shop stood Phidias, with his entire body turning blue. Harris and Yolanda scowled at the gnome, who then noticed his skin alteration. Huh, he said. Oh, uh, I was testing a potion I found, but I don't want it. Yolanda turned to Harris and said they would need 100 silver pieces. With his purse nearly emptied, the three adventurers left the business with the potions in a hay-filled box. The people of Red Bluffs stood by the road as the trio wandered by, and all were in awe of the tiny blue man. By the time the party arrived back at the inn, Phidias had turned back to his lackluster self. Omel, Grish, and Brother Stance were outside on the porch, looking out onto the calm bay. Any luck? said Grish. Luck, yes. Expensive luck. Each of us will have a small bottle of healing fluid in case we need it. Why was it so expensive? queried the monk. Yolanda motioned to the rogue, who pointed out that he began to sample some items. Well, that money's coming out of your cut, gnome, growled the angry Sir Omel. I'm not concerned, replied Phidias. I think I can raise the money with my new skill. New skill? asked Grish. Yes, replied Phidias. I'm going to be a musician. He pulled forth the large conch shell that had annoyed the party the previous day and gave a long, noisy blast on it. Where did you get that? Yolanda asked. I don't know, Phidias said. I think it was just lying in the street. We close out this episode now and give you our thanks for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at The Bards Podcast. For everyone in Adventures of Philbar, thanks for listening.